Yes, I wrote this in red. Uh, uh, it's these nightmares of wet dreams, these sick thoughts in my head. Uh, uh, I didn't write this on my phone, cause my phone was dead. Uh, uh, so I wrote this in red ink. Yes, I wrote this in red. I wrote this in red. Uh, Our guest this week is Anthony Pierre. He's the founder and CEO of Estate Master Real Estate Academy, author and minister. He enjoys teaching people how to invest in real estate and create financial freedom. Anthony was born and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio, where he currently lives with his wife and four children. His eight week mentoring program was initially taught in a university setting, but is now available to everyone. Anthony has empowered hundreds of students with financial literacy and changed their lives through his simple five-step real estate investment system with love and integrity. Anthony Pierre's life was turned upside down when he was suddenly arrested and sent to prison for six years. While in prison, he searched deep within himself to understand who he was. And during the crisis, he found his love of writing, which he first had discovered during childhood. Anthony loves poetry, motivational articles, and real estate investing publications. While in prison, Anthony taught hundreds of students his real estate investing secrets and created one of the most successful real estate investment programs in the state of Ohio prison system through Urbana University. Through public speaking and teaching life lessons, Anthony inspires people to change their mindset and stop seeing themselves as failures. He explains failure is so powerful that it can control your life despite all your successes and become a vacuum sucking the life out of all your achievements. In his first book, Boundless Success, available, available on Amazon, Anthony explores the meaning of failure and why we should stop seeing ourselves as such. He says, I believe there is no such thing as failure and that we must look at our lives as a series of events and stages that foster growth in our weaknesses. So thank you for being here, Anthony. You're very welcome, man. Good job, man. You got that, got out that all in, didn't you? That was I did. I did. I had to take a couple of deep breaths, but I got it all in. <laughs> I guess I guess it's a lot on me, huh? I did, did a lot, man. So thank yeah. you, man. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you for uh, inviting. Well, thank you for being here as well. I think you have a magnificent story about how you move from one phase of your life to a different phase of your life and taking wisdom and new experiences and sort of using that as something to catapult you into success, you know, just because you have some um, bumble, some uh, rumblings in the past and, you know, some things have happened that were not necessarily the best things, but to take those experiences and create something um, great from it, I think it's an amazing success story. Thank you, man. Thank you, man. I, it, you know, I can all I can say is this, man. You know, uh, this is one of those situations where we all go through things in life, and we tend to have situations where we be challenged, and and we have to, you know, make decisions, and sometimes we even have to look ourselves in the mirror and and really try to figure out who we are, you know, mm -hmm. what our purpose is, and, and really what we need to be doing uh, at that moment and moving forward. And I think that I had one of those epiphanies when, you know, I got into the situation that caused me to go to prison. I had to really sit back and, and really evaluate my whole entire life and who I was, because I wasn't someone who just got in trouble when I was in those knucklehead 18, 19 years old. I caught this particular case when I was 36 years old. So, wow. oh man, you know, so with me being in this situation, it's a series of decisions that I made some bad ones that led to it. So when I was in my situation, I really had to think about my life in general, like, okay, uh, this is pretty bad. This situation is pretty bad. You're probably not going to get out of this situation. And at that mm -hmm. time, I was looking at like 22 years in prison. So uh, with that being said, I had to really, really focus on, okay, 
what is my life going to look like here in the future? And then how am I going to endure this situation? Because it was horrible because you got to think I was a guy who never been in trouble, really. You know, I never really had any real issues uh, when I was when I was young. Now, of course, as as a teenager and growing up, we all do little silly stuff, but I've never done anything that really put me in sheer jeopardy of really being, uh, you know, locked up other than probably getting caught by st- stealing and being brought home to your parents you know what I mean so so nothing really serious like that so with that being said uh I really had to kind of look at my whole entire life because I did have a a pretty successful start right after college with me investing in real estate and really building a a a really uh nice company a million dollar company and then for me to make series of decisions that cost me to not only lose that but lose everything at that point wow find myself looking uh, at this time in prison, which was at that time, like 22 years in prison. Uh, so mm-hmm. that's a, that right there is just a situation that really, I think people can't necessarily may not have had that happen, but as you hear the story and go through it, I'm sure there's millions out there that can relate. Yeah, definitely. Uh, a lot of brothers can definitely relate to what you're talking about. What's amazing is the other side of it is getting to the other, getting to the other side of, you know, disappointment, you know, cause when things like that happens, you know, only, the, the only, you don't only disappoint yourself, you disappoint your family and friends and loved ones as well. And so you have to, you know, when bad things happen, the question that I think you have to ask, sometimes people do ask, sometimes they don't, how do I, how do I build or how do I pick myself up from, from where I've fallen, you know? So um, I wanted to ask you, so what are the life experiences that you've had that, that made you sort of, I guess, fall from grace? Because you said that you had a million dollar company, things were going well, I assume, Mm-hmm. from what you're saying and then this thing happens that that caused you to have six years in prison that's a fall from grace yeah 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 you know uh and and I, and I like the the term that you use fall from grace because a lot of people use that in terms of like hey you up here and then all of a sudden bang you kind of you know now you're down here uh so I like that you use that term fall from grace, but Mm -hmm. really, you know, I like to challenge that term in the sense of this. Okay. In reality is that all of us have successes and failures in our lives. We go through, we go through these hills up and down. Okay. I might've been doing well, maybe financially, but was I doing well spiritually? I might've been doing well spiritually, but I'm suffering financially, you know? So really we all are going through life trying to figure out this balancing act on how to really have a happy life. Uh, So although I did, you know, was doing really well with the business at that particular time, when I caught this case, it shows that I was lacking in some other areas because Mm. what would put me in that predicament to even make the decisions that caused me uh, to be even there. So in that situation, Mm. so what I really learned at that particular time, and I'll be honest with you, is that I always had this by any means necessary type mentality ever since a kid is like, you know, I'm gonna get it by any means necessary. And I also had this mentality too, that, you know, I won't break the rubber band, but I'll stretch it. You know what I mean? Mm. So, so that, that in itself, when you look at it, that could be detrimental when yeah. it really challenged because that's kind of, you know, you, you, you think that, Oh, I got to get out here and make it. I got to go get this money anyway. I got to get it. Uh, and then when things are going bad, you know, I can always go back to the streets so I can do this. Or you just kind of got this ideal in your head that I'm just going to get it how I need to get it, you know, right. uh, but you're not really thinking about the consequences on the other side. So for me, it was that mentality, this, this by any means, you know, almost Malcolm X type mentality that kind of, I think was the poison that was already kind of set in me that kind of put me in a predicament uh, that I was in. Mm -hmm. And here's why first and foremost is that, you know, I've always been a given person. I always love to help people. But I always felt an obligation to my community, too, as I was having successes to reach back down and try to get other people. Well, for Mm -hmm. me, I came from nothing, you know, so, you know, a lot of my family, a lot of my friends, my closest confidant, you know, they're in in the world doing things. Most of them doing things they ain't got a business doing. 
Mm-hmm. So a lot of times I'm reaching back down and saying, hey, you know, this, that, you know, trying to help people. Uh, so then I kind of found myself entangled uh, with really, you know, what I'm saying friends and even family that I probably shouldn't have been associating with because I wasn't really realizing that if something was to go wrong, it can all backlash on me because I'm right. the one that's successful. When in my mind, I'm thinking I'm reaching down, I'm trying to help. Uh, let me help this guy out. And then mm-hmm. in this situation, I ended up making a decision to help an individual, a close, close, very dear, close friend, uh, simply because he was in a bind. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I already had, you know, I had, a, you know, I had a beautiful high rise in, in Chicago at that time. I mean, overlooks the whole, you know, pier, beautiful. And I was heading back and forth going through there. So when he had a situation and asked me to do something for him, it not only was it going to help him, but it was going to help me because he had owed me money for some real estate, some things that I did. So I just made a decision, you know, a poor decision, but mm-hmm. I made that decision really after five times I said, no, like, no, no. So mm-hmm. I, you know, I was like, no, no. But then his situation was so desperate and dire that he continued to keep asking me to help him. So I finally broke down because I, I started focusing on less about the risk and I started focusing more on the money. So, mm. so what was the lesson? The first yeah. lesson that I learned was that, you know, it's a biblical principle. It's a Corinthians, first Corinthians 15, 33, which says bad association spoils use for habits. So mm. I realized at that moment that I was a victim of bad association and that an association is a decision that you make. You decide yeah. who you want to yeah. be with. Right. Right. So, for, so a few months, a couple of months of bad associations and just kind of being in the wrong place, you know, end up putting me in a predicament where I end up catching a wave of things that had nothing to do with me. And now I'm caught up in a major case and investigations and things that had everything to do with him, nothing really to do with me. But then now, because I'm the one with the real estate, all this legitimate stuff that, oh, maybe this guy is the the guy really behind it, or maybe he's the guy, you know, that's doing, you know, so now I'm in this mess and I'm like, wait a minute. No, you know, I was just doing a favor, you know, but, but at the end of the day, they don't really care. And it taught me a lot about the legal system and how our legal system work. Uh, because at that time, you know, we see what we see on TV. You know, we know that, you know, you walk around with a hoodie or whatever cop get behind you. We know anything can happen at that moment. But when you actually get entangled into the system, you really realize how the system is really built against us in, in such a happy way because you're just pretty much guilty before, you know, proven innocent no matter what. And then you got prosecutors and things that's going to stack the cards against you simply because it's, you know, it's easy for them to actually get convictions because I know in Ohio, it's like a 95% conviction rate. So a lot of stuff doesn't go to trial or people don't really challenge it. And uh, we have a police system that tends to break the law, to uphold the law. So for me, on a moral standpoint, I had to look at all those things like, man, you know, and I didn't know these things until you get in it and you see it like, so you Maybe there do. was a lesson. I think some of the lesson was, I mean, of course, I mean, sometimes things happen mm-hmm. that we, we would prefer not to happen. And the lessons to learn, regardless who you are, what level of society you're in, there are some lessons that you're going to have to learn. And maybe the lessons that, you know, part of the lesson that you were learning was not only, you know, about guilty by association, being in the wrong place at the wrong time, helping the wrong person, but also you needed to see what the system was really like, you know, and then by understanding that what you're doing now is actually helping people because you have a better understanding about a system that's very, very broken. Exactly. And I, and I think that was the first thing I understood was the importance of our association. Second thing, like you point out, I realized that our system was extremely broken and I saw that we were being, you know, huge victims of this broken system. And I also saw that it's almost like an epidemic, you know what I'm saying? In terms of yeah, know, systemic, I, mean, I call systemic. it systemic. systemic. Yeah. Epi- yeah. It's a systemic, you know what I'm saying? Epidemic that's happening all around, especially America, man, we got over 2.5 million, you know, nonviolent. I mean, people locked up in prison. So, so for me, you know, I, I, now I started paying attention to these things, man. And I started really looking at it more so because now I'm in it and I'm like, okay, this is crazy. So uh, for me, you know, I realized, especially from, uh, you know, drug dealer standpoint, me dealing with that aspect of it, that, you know, uh, 
man, this, you you in a system, man, that if, you know, if I was you, I would I would stay far away from that world simply because you in a situation where you cannot win. All the cards are stacked against you. Mm-hmm. And is it really worth it? So that was like one of my very, very first lessons, man, that humbled me and made me really realize like, man, you know, this is this is pretty bad because it's, mm-hmm. it's bigger than just me now. It's like I'm looking around, man. I'm seeing I'm in the in the institution with over 2000 inmates now, like, you know, and, and I'm looking around and and I see a lot of these people are, you know, just people that was just trying to be out here and, and trying to figure out and make their way, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a lot of times it's systematic. I mean, you know, it's systemic is, you know, you, you're a product of your environment, you know, and yeah, what you yeah. know and what you see. And one of the other things that I realized too, DJ, is that, that we tend to grow up in situations where we're around things that we shouldn't be around. And we come from communities like that, where we're seeing people doing drugs. It's normal. It's, it's, it's normal. like, it's, yeah, it's normal. So you don't automatically think, oh no, I'm not I'm not going to speak to my cousin again because, you know, he's a drug dealer. It's like he's my cousin. So I'm going to, you know, deal with him to some level. But in, in, but like you said, that still can cause problems for you, even when you're dealing with people that you love and you're related to can be caused to be guilty by association. Exactly. Or like you said, make a decision out of love and that actually can put you in jeopardy like I did. And then you actually get jammed up and get caught while you're doing it. And then now you're looking at, you know, what I'm saying 22 years in prison. So mm-hmm. that was uh, that was the lesson in itself for me. Mm-hmm. And I really had. Uh, so that was your that was your rock bottom. That's where you like, OK, I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm this is where my decisions have because, I mean, we, I believe that little phrase of, you know, first you get a pebble, then you get a, a, a brick, then you get a brick wall. And, mm-hmm. you know, so you may help somebody and that you really shouldn't be helping. And then, um, you know, you get away with it. Nobody says anything. You know, it, it doesn't, hit, in other words, you know, crap doesn't hit the fan, right? And then mm-hmm. the second time and the third time, that's when, you know, or whatever, how many times, but it's more than one time you help somebody um, doing the right thing, like you said, out of love, you're you're helping someone, and then that backfires, and and that's the lesson that even I had to learn about helping people. You want to be, as they say, uh, say you know, Superman for people, you know, Captain to save somebody, you know, and you want to do that for people, but the spiritual law is like you just stated within Corinthians. That mm-hmm. that's not your job. Sometimes I learned that my job is just to pray. <laughs> <laughs> you pray and, you know, I'll send you a book, man. Uh, I may send you a couple of dollars to help you out. But at the end uh, of the day, you got to stay far away from that type of stuff, man. Because yeah. It's just not worth it. And also what I learned, too, is, is that you have to create the type of environment that if they're going to latch on to you, they're going to latch on in a way where they're being fed and uplift and it's yeah. actually changing their lives and it's motivating them to want to go in the other direction instead of you reaching down into their environment, you know what I'm saying, trying to fix different things and solve problems that they created within their own, you know what I'm saying, world and business that may be illegitimate. Mm-hmm. You actually can say, well, look, there's another way. And the crazy thing, about this situation is, is that the decision, the night before the decision, I had told him, I says, look, you got that money over there, man. Instead of doing this, I says, just get that to me in every 90 to, you know, I said every 90 to 120 days, you can probably make anywhere between, you know, 30 to 40 grand off of that money legitimately, man. Instead of you continuing to, to do this, you want to, he, he wanted to start a business. And I was like, let's start this business, man. And, and you, but in his mind, it's that fast money. It's like I, just one more mm-hmm. go around. If I can just mm-hmm. get to here, mm-hmm. you know, uh, then I can make it. But long, you know, look back and I say, man, you know, what would have happened had he just says, you know what, you right, man. You know, I probably would never been in my situation. I would have been able to empower, help him, and then also help him see a world that, you know, he just didn't understand at that time. And it was mm-hmm. just kind of foreign to him. You know, you got people that's making money illegally and they want to do business. You know, they want to do legitimate business, but then, you know, they don't know what to do or they got ideas about what to do, but then they don't know, well, how to execute, how to execute, who can help me. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I learned that as well, because that was a, that was a a pivotal moment. So um, we made the decision collected. I said, he says, I said, make the decision. He sat there for about half an hour thinking about it. 
And I thought he was going to go the other way because he was thinking about it really hard. And then he says, nah, man, just let's just go, just go get that from me. And, you know, mm -hmm. I said, all right, man, you know, so and that was that. And then it, it's history before you know it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm locked up and, you know, I'm in prison over this situation. Mm -hmm. and, and then I seen the power of our government. I seen the power of the system. I watched them take my cars. I watched them take money to take the monies out my bank account. I watched them do all these things and I had no control over it. And they pretty much did it, you know what I'm saying, you know, illegally, technically, but you know what I'm saying, for them, you know, how can I prove it? I'm locked up and then who's going to listen to me? So not to harper too much on the legal system, we all know the legal system is broken, but more so for education for myself, that was empowering. That, that helped me to really appreciate not only moving forward, mm -hmm. how I needed to go about my life, but also, also how I can help others be able to right. see the world from a different yeah. perspective. Yeah, the, the bigger lesson in it, because, you know, I believe uh, every situation has a lesson in it, regardless if you get it or not. <laughs> There's yeah. a lesson to, to get. And sometimes it's an easy lesson, and sometimes it's a hard lesson. But um, in your case, it was a hard lesson. But the lesson, and like I, it sounds like you definitely understood the lesson that you got, because while you were there, your time in prison, you had you the understanding and the knowledge that you had helped to a, a lot many other folks that wouldn't have gotten that help if you wasn't there i'm not saying it's a good thing to be locked up people i'm just saying that you took that experience and you didn't go woe is me just in prison you want to help other people to teach them how they can um be better so yeah. how, how did you do that? For years, I've used medicinal herbs because they are a great way to flush your kidneys and gallbladder, strengthen your immune system, de-stress your heart, and increase proper blood flow. Medicine Man Plant Co. is a Texas-based company that believes in using state-of-the-art best practices enforced by the FDA to ensure the best quality of herbs. Their herbs are blended from the world's best ancient plants and mushrooms proven effective across thousands of years. Medicine Man Plant Co. uses modern science to powder and compress easy to swallow herbal capsules. They are powerful quality herbs that help you stay healthy. Try their stone breaker pill if you want to flush your kidneys and gallbladder. The blood pressure pill will help promote proper blood flow and circulation and also addresses high blood pressure. The uric acid pill will keep your joints and extremities clean and pain-free. So go to www.medicinemanplantco.com to begin receiving herbal medicine like the liver pill, which will power up and protect your liver and detoxify your body, or even the immune pill that will defend your body and support and strengthen both your innate and active immune systems. Again, that's www.medicinemanplantco.com. Well, you know, uh, one, one, one point of it is this, is that first and foremost, I had to be real with myself. Mm. I had to actually, uh, because, you know, when I caught this case, I had, you know, I got four kids, my oldest daughter was 16, my son, uh, my oldest son was 10, my next son was eight, and then my youngest daughter was two. Uh, so, you know, and, and I was the type of dad that I was been an entrepreneur, you know, since it's really coming out of college. Uh, so I was always that dad that was always there for my kids, I always was a part of the recitals, I always went to the field trips, you know, mm -hmm. I'll be the only male there. So I took pride in that, man. I, I enjoyed that. So now with my life being turned upside down, I started to have this feeling of, you know, like, I, like, like a failure, like looking at my life as if like it added up to this moment and what for, you know, because the thing that I really love most now has been taken from me. And I had all this time to really start thinking. And I started questioning myself, started questioning my life, started questioning my purpose, my existence. Like, you know, and so so the lesson is not necessarily from a prison perspective. This can be anybody that's dealing with anything in their life right now that may be a huge challenge. It may not be that challenge. It mm -hmm. may be a huge challenge that's questioning yourself it may be your business is failing right now it may be a relationship that's failing right now it may be making you question your being at some point in time what i realized is that 
first and foremost, you have to actually really look at the reality of the situation. What was the reality? Well, the reality is, is that, okay, you're going to prison for six years. It doesn't even matter. You know, the next reality is, is that your kids is going to be affected by this, whether you like it. If you are in prison, when you're doing time, your kids and your family are going to do time right with you. Oh, so yeah. That was, that's a, so that was another reality. So then the only, the other, the only other thing that I can do next is really focus on, okay, well, how can I better myself? How can I learn from this? Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. that was the journey in itself. Okay. How can I never allow something like this to ever happen again? And that was the, the point of it. So I had to break myself down to nothing and I had to start assessing my life and picking the pieces up because you go through a period. of so, so what, what do you mean? Break yourself down to nothing. Well, because when you have a lot of success in life, you know, you tend to maybe have a big head, maybe kind of look at yourself, maybe think that how could this happen to me and, you know, how, you know, and, and kind of have a sense of arrogance. Uh, so I had to allow myself to be broken down in the sense that I had to realize that I really knew nothing. I had to kind of start from beginning, like not as if like I know anything. So I mm-hmm. had to start listening more. I had to start paying attention. I had to start meditating on things that I was learning and really thinking deep about it so that I can get the full message out of it so that I can implement it in my life. And that's where the the spiritual side of me, you know what I'm saying, kind of developed. And I realized Mm -hmm. that, you know, the only person really greater than me is the most high God. So I needed to take some time to really start listening. So that's where, you know, my foundation started to be built because, my foundation before was lacking because it caused me to be in prison. Why did I make Mm. all these decisions? So I built a new foundation and I really started looking things more from a spiritual standpoint. So I started focusing on myself spiritually. And then I started thinking about things from a spiritual perspective in terms of my mentality. I started thinking about my moral foundation in terms of what do I believe? Do I believe what is right and what is wrong? Is it okay to lie? Should you, is there such thing as a white lie? Should you have a white, is a white lie okay? Mm-hmm. You so, know, this, so, so this basically challenged your whole belief structure, exactly. basically. Yes, mm. my belief structure because, and I had, and I needed something to tie it to to help reconstructed in a way that I knew that it had been stronger than what it was before. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for many, it may be different things. And, and, you know, for, for me, it was the actual Bible. It was the actual spiritual looking at, you know, saying what our purpose is trying to understand why was we created? What is this whole thing? What should I be doing with my life? So long story short, that helped me to start laying the right type of foundation because it humbled me and it made me to start seeing people that may originally was invisible to me. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. now when I'm walking around a yard, I see people. Mm. I don't just see like criminals. I don't see, I didn't see none of that anymore. I you see, see you see the story, not just exactly. Uh, mm. Yeah, that, so, so yeah, so I, I started to see people. So I seen them for what they was. It wasn't about, I didn't care if they was a rapist or if they was this. I started to see people like, okay, and everybody has a story. And then yeah. I started understanding that it all starts with the foundation. Whatever led a person to do anything that may be criminally, whether it's the most heinous crime ever, it all starts with the foundation. Yeah. It all starts with usually someone who molests kids was molested. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's yeah. sick, but it's it's but in, again, yeah. that even that person, that sick sick person, still has a story that yeah. goes along with their mentality. I mean, it's it's a uh, unfortunately. I mean, it, you know, you're a a product of your environment and your and how you interpret that experiences. Those experiences definitely will have some re- some implications and repercussions on uh, you know how you are how you be in this world and it could be detrimental to the people around you and the environment you know it's like the, the environment is constructing you and you're constructing the environment at the same time you know right. in a positive or a negative way Exactly. So how you're looking at the world is through whatever eyes of influence that you've had in your life. Uh, so it's actually prompting your decisions. Uh, and that's why you see a lot of kids and even teenagers. I mean, you know, God built us in a way that at a certain level in life, we we want to take on a certain level of responsibility. It is mm-hmm. natural for us to want to challenge 
if something is right, if something is wrong, we won't learn unless we do. But at the same time, you know, the the foundation has to be set right. And that's where, you know, parents and things like that come in play to make sure that the kids, you know, have the right type of foundation. But then you got to edify yourself from those experiences and what, you're te- what, what they're teaching you. So that way you can implement them in your life so that you got a strong foundation going out in life. And I think that is where, you know, a lot of our youth, a lot of our kids, and that's even us as parents, some of us is lacking that mm-hmm. being able to install that type of foundation on our kids so that they got the right type of structure because a lot of times mm-hmm. they didn't have it. So, right. You can't give what you don't have. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah, if you didn't get the lessons and, and you know, uh, I don't know who in your life was an entrepreneur that inspired you to be an entrepreneur out the gate. But, you know, most people don't have that. They don't have that that blue that blueprint to follow. So who was that in your life who said, you know, that inspired you to say, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to look for nine to five. You know what? I, I didn't, I didn't really, it was a series of events because like you said, you look up, I mean, I don't, I still to this day, I mean, I got uncles now that I've been setting up business after they've been working for, for 50, 60 years now that's actually doing business and saying, man, I, w- I wish I did this 30 years ago. I'm, I'm making $20,000 a month now, you know, but they didn't have, they didn't have no one to mm. take them, you know? So, so me, you know, in my, in my family, when I, when I look at my overall family, you know, I was, I'm really that first one that really stepped out into the entrepreneur, like, business owning business and doing business and i really didn't have a god i had to get like mentors and find people and mm-hmm. harass people like hey how you do that you know just to get the information that i needed so i can get from point a to b and then continue to move down the line until i was able uh to make moves and that so that was you know so it was really a lot of mentors early for me uh so that's why me personally i'm you know with the educational program that i have that's why i'm big on mentoring because when I started to see people in prison and really seeing them, you know, for who they was and what was going on, mm-hmm. I was, I was open. Uh, my heart had kind of opened up to try to figure out a way to help them. Mm-hmm. And, 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 that, and so I kind of took on this role of coaching, mentoring, teaching, you know, with the idea that if I can teach one, maybe I can teach millions. So, you know, I had, you know, the interesting thing that happened with me, you know, given all the successes that I had prior to that with mentoring and then then building this business that, you know, we went from, I went from nothing to purchasing 17 houses in six months, put over $420,000 in my pocket, built a $2.2 million real estate business fresh out of college. You know, I hadn't been out of college for two years, you know, so to build that, that and then to watch that all crumble and then I'll, I'll lose that mm-hmm. and then to be in this situation I actually you know started to really get excited about my future and that's why I kind of with this idealist book like there's no such thing as failure I started really now because I started to build my my foundation not on money not on what I had but from a spiritual perspective to make sure that I'm I'm thinking right morally. I'm 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 making decisions in the right way that's in accordance with his thinking versus my own. Mm-hmm. It started to help me break out of this shell that you in that's confining you from really being able to see the world. So now I'm able to see. So now that I'm able to see, I see that all these issues and problems. So I'm naturally creative. So I'm thinking like, well, how could I help solve some of these problems? And for a while, I didn't know. Only the reason I knew it was from maybe just help people spiritually. So that was my first journey. So I started, you know, teaching. I, I got baptized, became an ordained minister. And then I started helping and teaching others. And that's kind of where it started. And it was more from a spiritual perspective perspective so in your so in your book boundless success gotta Mm -hmm. put the book out there so in your book how if i was to buy that book and and read it and and it's definitely available on amazon for you and i'll leave a link down in the show description so how and what is the lesson that you want um the reader to get from your book when they're done reading it what is it what is the the major points that you want them to gather from it the, the the major point is in that book really is helping you to see your life from a different perspective and change your mindset. 
no matter where you is, whether you're in prison, whether you're dealing with a relationship, whether you're dealing with a business failing, it doesn't matter where you are in your life. The difference between you being able to overcome it and, and get where you're trying to go is really your mind shift. Mm -hmm. From a mental health standpoint, I could allow that situation to really tear me down and affect yeah. me, and I could yeah. never have been right in my mind, and I could have lived on my past successes and always being, oh, man, mm -hmm. I used to be this, man, I used to, but then right back out, because here's the problem when you go to prison, either you're going to come out better, you're going to come out worse, yeah. so I could have went and the other ride. Right. So yeah. this book is helping you to see that I don't care where you at, they can put you in the middle of a lion's den, it doesn't matter. You change your mindset in terms of how you looking at the situation, the whole environment around you change. And I changed my mindset by challenging the word failure. And one of the things that I realized is that in the Bible, God never uses the word failure. So he never at any point in time calls us a failure. So why are we calling ourselves failure? And mm -hmm. I realized too, in order for some- And the judgment of other people can sometimes really weigh you down when because you might not see yourself as a failure, but- after people it finished with you. <laughs> yeah, they start telling you, like, man, how you do it? You're a failure. Mm. So yeah, so so mm. that's why your mind should have to, your mind shift have you gotta to be change. strong, gotta be strong minded as you, well. You have to be strong minded, but if your mind shift change, even if somebody came at you with that, you able to empower them with information. Okay. Right? Like, like let's say for some man, did you, you know, man, you're a failure. This is I just give you an example. Somebody was a company like that. I say. So what's the definition of failure? Have you ever looked it up? Because you use that word, but most people use it very, very loosely. So mm. before you call me a failure, look up the word. And then I want you to come back and tell me if I'm a failure. Because a fa to, for something to fail, it has to completely stop. Mm -hmm. It has to quit. You know, if, you, if that mic failed right now, I couldn't hear you. Right. Right? But as long as that mic working, is it? It doesn't matter. It might get a little low. You might have to adjust it. You might mm -hmm. have to fix a few things on it to get it right. Mm -hmm. But it ain't failed yet. And that's yeah. the same thing with our lives. When we make decisions, we might make some bad decisions. It might, you know what I'm saying, cause some, some stumbling blocks for us. It might mm -hmm. slow us down. It might even pull us down a little bit. But really, you're not a failure unless you stop. Right. Uh, and, and to me, quit. I say you're not a failure until your last... You take your last breath. There's right. always, you know, if you got a, a breath in your body, there's always an opportunity to do more, right? Exactly. Because life is not defined by our moments, you know what I'm saying, of complications. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. it's not, life is not defined by that. Mm -hmm. And when you're moving yourself out of that, because you got what I would have to say of, you know, listening to your story is that you don't look to be validated by others because if you had, if you needed that, you know, that validation by others and, you know, people want to call you a failure and they don't necessarily say it to your face, but you get the energy from them about what they're thinking about you. Mm -hmm. And when you don't say, you know, I don't care what you think about me. This is what I'm, I'm going to continue my success. I understand the principles of success and I'm going to keep moving. Yeah, I had to learn a lesson. It's a hard lesson, but I even help people in that situation. I brought people up. So to me, I think one of the things that I get from you is that you did not need the validation from others to tell you who you were. Exactly. I had to, and I had to, I had to figure that out. I had to come to that conclusion when I started to challenge that word. And then once I started to challenge it, I realized that why you, you don't need validation from anybody. All you need to do is decide what you're about to do going forward and do it with all your heart and all your might with the right type of foundation and with the right type of focus. That's it. Move forward. You can't fail if you, like, for example, you might be in bed and not want to get out of bed. If you get out of bed, that was a success. Mm -hmm. Life is in the a, in a stages of many successes. You know what I'm saying? Those successes, you know what I'm saying, is what counterpoints you to whatever greatness that you desire. But even along the way with the greatness, anything can happen that may be a challenge. So I don't look at life when things go wrong as a failure. I look at them as challenges. I look at them as maybe stumbling blocks. What are you going to do? Because if I use the word failure, it's almost telling you like your life is over. You're nothing. 
But if I look at it like, look, young man, that's just a stumbling block. But what are you going to do next? Mm -hmm. You got your whole life in front of you. That that prison was just a page in my book of life. Yeah, that's what I like to hear right there. Yes. Because it what what's so amazing is you didn't allow that page to define who you was when people people do that i mean they 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 have a bad experience and that's all they talk about you know but mm-hmm. for you it's like okay this was a page it's a reality i had to face but it's not the last page and it's not the it's not the the, the you know how you have these books they have like the you know i said when i was a kid i, I see a book and i would say i hope it got the pictures in the in the, in the book <laughs> <laughs> and you know they had like the pretty the pictures the better right right and it's like you're not you're not doing that it's like look uh, this this might be one of those pictures in the book out of all the the, the other uh, other pages in the book but Look, it's gonna be, it's gonna be, a, it's gonna be a coloring book right here. This is gonna, <laughs> we're gonna, yeah. we're gonna have a lot of pictures in this book that's going to, and that's going to help people and going to enhance people's lives, inspire people. So yeah, it's, you you got it, you got it. That that one page in my life does not define me. Exactly, man. So in anything in life, you need energy. And see, when you start to use negative words like failure, it saps your energy. Mm -hmm. So you don't even have the energy now. You're zapping yourself. You're taking the energy that you need in order to be able to push forward. No matter how big the challenge is, if if you have the energy to put behind it to challenge it, you can overcome it. Because eventually, because you're pushing against it, you're going to eventually break through it. The thing Mm -hmm. is, what, what, what happens is, is that it wants you to quit or wants you to stop. Or mm-hmm. wants you to give up. Yeah. So for me, I realized that okay, I man, I did five. I did when I graduated from college. I was in college for five years, so I got to do six years. So I'm gonna approach this like college mindset. I'm changing the way I think of it now. So I'm gonna take advantage of every educational aspect that I can take. For, I'm gonna humble myself. I'm not gonna come in here and, and be like, oh, I used to do this. No, I, I'm nothing. So I brought myself down, and then I was willing to learn. And with that being said. I end up learning. I end up picking up a trade of becoming a competent mechanic and got certified as a mechanic. I used to be wow. my hand. You see what I'm saying? I was always in business suits and stuff like that. I also end up passing one of the most toughest tests in America to pass, which is your water one and water two license, which wow. only has a 40% pass rating. And that's for people on the street. So I was able to pass it with, with, with high, you know what I'm saying? Grades to pass and get my water one and my water two. These are successes to me. Mm -hmm. So while I'm in prison, I'm challenging myself and putting myself out of my comfort zone. I end up becoming, you know what I'm saying? An ordained minister. I'm helping tons of people find themselves spiritually. That was a success. And And that was the missing piece. I think, I think you had, you had the, you know, the, the financial things, the financial stability, you had the business success, but maybe what what this um, with that page in your life, what it taught you was that you also need that spiritual success as well. Exactly, because you need a moral compass in order to go through this life to help you navigate it and make wise decisions. If you don't have a moral compass in the back, you know, and that and something telling you what's right and what's wrong, and you being able to understand it and believe it so that you can move forward, then what's going to happen is you like blowing in the wind. You could mm-hmm. be having successful, but you're creating your own moral values. So therefore, your, your values uh, may be kind of perverted in a sense, because you may say, well, I believe that, you know, you may be the type of person that get mad and, and resent anybody that lied to you, but you okay with someone uh, that, uh, that may steal occasionally. <laughs> yeah. You know yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I like, can give you examples of that in yeah. my life, you know, that's you no, know, why, why is this okay? And this not okay. You know, exactly. <laughs> and, people, and, and but that's most people. So so all of those, anybody that kind of has that, you, you're kind of setting yourself up, you know, what I'm saying to be let down in so many different ways because you're going to end up being challenged. But if you got a strong foundation spiritually and you really, you know, believe that it's 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 wrong to lie, period. No lie is mm-hmm. a good lie. That mm-hmm. makes it that that makes it easy because yeah. when 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 when, a, when you're facing a lie, you already realize that it's wrong, so you're able to move forward versus mm-hmm. actually trying to justify it in your head that well that wasn't that bad. No, it yeah. was a lie. So yeah. you know what I'm saying. So and if it's a consequence behind it, then accept the consequence and then yeah. move forward. So I really so, learned- so the whole experience definitely 
um, I like the word that you used. You said that it it gave you a moral compass or strengthened your moral compass mm -hmm. to be able to stand on and say, that's wrong. And I'm not doing that. I'm sorry. And no, I, 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 you know, and I get it because I be, I, I've been through that, too, where I want to help somebody. And because you want to help them so badly, you know, you're willing to step outside of your own moral compass to to help them. Mm -hmm. And then the question is that when you get beyond that kind of thinking, the question that you're going to have to deal with is, OK, well, what can I do for this person? You know, that I ignore them. I treat them badly. You know what? what but I learned pray for them. It's the best thing you can say. It's, I'll pray for you. You know, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll hold you in the light and I really mean it. Yeah. But that's, that's the most that I can do for you. And it sounds like you understand that the power of prayer, that's a powerful statement. It's, it's powerful to pray for somebody. It's, it's probably more powerful for me to get on my knees and pray for you than to give you money. Uh, exactly. Because I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you know, someone, uh, you know, if you can't necessarily provide them what they need, you praying the more prayers on their behalf, eventually what they need will be right there in front of them because God to make sure that they have what they need, you yeah. know, so they'll get it even if they can't get it from you. It started with you with prayer because that's all you was able to give them at that particular time because you didn't have what they need, what they felt like they needed. But mm -hmm. what tends to happen is, is that they end up finding out themselves that they really didn't need that, that they actually needed something yeah. else. Mm -hmm. that that you wouldn't you wouldn't have ever been able to give them anyway so they were mm -hmm. able to get that but but I, but I think uh, you know one of the great lessons again too uh, also was uh the moral compass but then also I learned the power of forgiveness like forgiving myself yeah you know learning to forgive myself I love my kids I you know my kids were dealing with issues and problems so and how did you do that how did you forgive yourself because that will to me that's the hardest person to forgive is yourself you know. Yeah, man. And, and it did, it took a lot of, you know what I'm saying, prayer. It took a lot of meditation. It, it took a lot of me meditating and really looking at my life in general. And what I realized is that uh, in order to really move forward in your life, you got to forgive yourself. Mm -hmm. You got to forgive yourself for what you did that may have caused you to be in this position, you know, and whatever it is, you got to forgive yourself. And, and I realized that. So once I was able to forgive myself and be like, mm -hmm. okay, phew, it's over. I, you know, I can't get that back. Uh, let me move forward. And I always talk about one of my favorite characters in the Bible, which was David. I always loved David because David was the type of person that he dealt with all these things. And he made these bad decisions. And one that one bad decision led to a few bad decisions. And then before you know it, he was in this mess. Uh, but when he actually was faced with it, uh, when 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 Nathan came to him and kind of made him realize that, you know, God recognized what he did. Mm -hmm. you know, David, the first thing he realized was the most important thing. And this is the lesson I got of it. He realized that he was actually forsaking the most important thing, which was his relationship with God. God had made him really see, like, had I not given you all these things? Have you mm -hmm. not had more than enough? You had wives. You Have I not given you more than you need? Why would you go take this from someone? You know, so mm -hmm. to make him really realize. So he realized that, man, I'm out of messed up. I'm about to mess up the most powerful thing that I have, which is not money, which is not friends, which is none of that, which is my personal friendship with God mm. and the blessings that he had and he was getting. So, so one of the things that he prayed for is he prayed that God wouldn't take his spirit away, wouldn't take his Holy Spirit because it was God's spirit that was allowing him to have all these successes. Mm -hmm. So he prayed that God continue to keep his spirit and continue to be with them. But he also realized, too, after he dealt with the situation with his son, that, you know, God, yes is yes, and his no is no. What he said was going to happen was going to happen. He ended up losing that son. And when it was over, he petitioned to, to save his son. But God had made that judgment, and it was a done deal. But after it was over, he got himself cleaned up. He moved on. But then he had to deal with the backlash of his decision. He mm -hmm. knew that eventually all these other things would eventually pr probably happen, and we saw it. He ended up having to deal with his son, taking over his kingdom, pushing him out of his kingdom, all that because his son lost respect for him because of his decisions that he made. Mm -hmm. So now you have to deal with that. So once I realized all these things, I was able to forgive myself because I realized that no matter what, it's going to be consequences. But I understand that 
if I want to do things the right way moving forward, God is going to forgive me, but he's not going to stop from whatever consequences that's going to come from my actions. So I gain that knowledge to understand that, okay, there will be consequences. So be ready to deal with them, but always keep your relationship with God. Don't let a consequence of your actions affect your relationship with God. You see what I'm saying? Because we tend to let things that happen to us in the first person we go to is like, I, I hate God. Or I, you did, you, why you know? No, it's a product of your bad decision. It doesn't mean that God left you. Mm-hmm. Now that's the trial. So are you going to keep your faith through it so that he can exalt you in the end like he did with David? So mm-hmm. that's what I learned from that. So that's what I decided to do. So I, I forgave myself and I moved forward. And then I started dealing with what I could do with my sons and, and my daughters. So I made, you know, my daughters was able to come up. My daughter was able to come up pretty often. My youngest daughter. So she was from two till she was, till, till I got out there. At, she was eight and she never even knew I was in prison. So that was a blessing from God because she just thought she was coming to a camp, an educational <laughs> camp for my dad. dad <laughs> and that was her time to read and have fun. And uh-huh. you know, we and I played with her while she was there and she looked forward to it. So for all those years, I was able to build this relationship with my youngest daughter. That was a blessing from God. You see what right, I'm saying? Right, so, right. and then on top of that, my sons, they had plenty of support while they was out here. And although they end up getting in some trouble, and by the time I got out of prison, I ended up having to get them out of some of the situations they was in, mm-hmm. but I knew that was a product of my decision. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Because mm-hmm. I wasn't there, but I was okay with that because now I built the foundation so that mm-hmm. no matter what going forward in their life, they have a light to look to that they can always go to because now, you know, dad is home and dad is going to do it right from here on out. So although you guys suffered, you know, I'm here now and therefore I'm going to teach you how to change your mindset because I know that you guys suffered and dealt with a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. So here's how you can overcome what you're dealing with to move forward so that you can take on life challenges and not let my hiccup start affecting your ability to be able to go out and be everything that you can be in your life. Because sometimes people allow what happened from a parent or a loved one affect their lives so that they can't get over it and they can't move forward so Mm -hmm. once i was able to do it now i can help other people's and that's what i started doing and it started when i was in prison uh when it started with my bunkie the first person who really reached out and said he wanted to learn how to invest in real estate Mm -hmm. and that was like my my first opportunity outside of just teaching people spiritually to teach people from a business standpoint that was part one of an amazing conversation i had with real estate in investment coach anthony pierre author of boundless success tune in wednesday october 27th for part two of our conversation anthony and i will discuss how he rebuilt his life and businesses after being incarcerated and how he was able to rebuild trust within his community and family in the meantime, you can stay in contact with me by emailing DJ at DJCareerCoach.com. Again, that's DJ at DJCareerCoach.com. I will leave links to my social media and to Anthony Pierre's social media in the show description. Be sure to subscribe, like, comment, and leave a review on Apple Podcast. Continue to discover and fulfill your spiritual calling. Until Wednesday, take care.